The letters page of the Times is an institution. Over the course of more than two centuries, it's become a key part of the national conversation. Every day, hundreds of people write into the Times and the Sunday Times with their own experience of the news, their opinions, their expertise and anecdotes, or perhaps just a witty riposte to the headlines. But the Times Letters page doesn't just reflect the news. It often ends up making it. The Archbishops of Canterbury and York have written a letter in the Times today saying that the government policy of sending migrants to Rwanda should shame us as a nation. Earlier this year, when there were fears that Boris Johnson would call yet another election, he was thwarted by a constitutional convention, the Lassels Principle, that was only ever written down in a letter to the Times. But the letters page isn't just a forum for the great and the good to express important ideas. It also allows readers to share intimate insights into their personal lives. I had panic attacks without knowing what these were, nightmares and agoraphobia. I'm writing this through tears of sadness, rage and incredulity. In a year when the news didn't seem to stop, what were the letters that stood out the most? You're listening to Stories of Our Times from The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm Manveen Rana. Today, Sir, the best letters of 2022. My name is Andrew Riley, and I am the letters editor of The Times. I read all the letters to the editor which readers send in. How many are you going through on on an average day? I mean, how big is the mailbag? It's big. I mean, I normally don't say because I don't want to give our competitors, um, well, I do want them to tremble, but I mean, it's several hundred on an average day, which you know is quite a challenge because I do read every single one. The Times in particular, the letters page has just been such an important part of the role it plays in society, you know, the, the role of the newspaper. When did the letters page begin and how does it begin? What are the first few letters you well, get? It, this is the most extraordinary thing. The very first letter to the Times, which was then called the Daily Universal Register, was on January the 1st, 1785. The first letter concerned the usefulness and necessity of newspapers. To conduct a newspaper with propriety is an arduous task. To give it consequence and success will require unremitting attention, words that that resonate today. And it ends, thus is a newspaper or magazine a toy shop where everyone has his hobby horse. It's a wonderful thing. All the S's appear as F's because it's 18th century. So it's not easy to read, but but it is quite, quite an entertaining read. It's morphed a lot since then. Try to explain to us what it means to have a letter in the Times. I think it still has a cachet, which it, it's always had. To get a letter in the Times, you are up against you know, stiff competition. And there is still this sort of sense that the, the Times is a sort of, the letters page anyway, is, is the fourth arm of the state. And if you can't get anywhere with your MP, then write to the Times. And in fact, I've got a wee bit here uh, on that. It just comes from Philip Howard's book. He relates this story. Approached by a friend who hoped that a word from the king in the right ear would solve a difficulty, George V said, My dear fellow, I can't help you. You'd better write to the Times. <laughs> and, and that's still a case that a letter can act as a catalyst for change. And I've got all sorts of wonderful examples here, if you'll give me a minute to just yes, tell you about Yes, tell us about some of the moments when that's happened. This is a letter from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, dated August the 14th, 1913, in which he extols the virtues of the Channel Tunnel. Now, that didn't open, as I'm sure all the readers will know, until 1994. <laughs> uh, he was ahead of his time. He was well ahead of his time. And he says, In your issue of today, Mr Roland McNeil describes the project of a Channel Tunnel as a crazy one. I venture to prophesy that when the thing has been done, the verdict of posterity will apply that adjective to the undignified and unjustified fears which have so long stood in the way of a great and beneficent national enterprise. So that's a good one. Here's another one. 
fabulous one. This Ernest Shackleton of endurance fame announced oh, wow. his transantarctic expedition in a letter to the editor on December the 29th, 1913. Now, we know what happened. He got trapped in the ice, endurance sank, and he didn't get back to the First World Wars nearly over. Sir, it's been an open secret for some time past that I have been desirous of leading another expedition to the South Polar regions. I am glad now to be able to state that, through the generosity of a friend, I can announce that an expedition will start next year with the object of crossing the South Polar continent from sea to sea. You can just hear his, his excitement. It's so poignant too, sort of knowing. Oh, it's all they're all wonderful. I, I, I could give you acres and acres of this. This is from Marie Stopes the campaigner for women's rights and also the founder of the first birth control clinic. In December the 16th, 1909, she said, Sir, there are in the country thousands of women who not only want the vote, but who are absolutely determined to get it. And they will get it. Behind them is working an invincible power, stronger than any opposition, the force of evolution. Now, she had to wait, but the, the real equality came with the 1928 uh, Equal Franchise Act, or Women Over 21 were given the vote the same rights as men but that's 1909 that's rather wow. wonderful and this one i think my favorite this comes from roger bannister the four minute mile man and ludwig gutmann who's the founder of the paralympic movement and they say sir we ask the courtesy of your columns to launch an appeal to help the rising number of paraplegics to pursue the games they are able to enjoy now that co-signed letter calling for times readers to help fund the stoke mandeville games or as they are now called the Paralympics was on March 20th, 1956. And now look where we are. We helped get the Paralympics started. And I didn't know that myself. I, that, that one's new to me. I just That's found it amazing. in the archive. I mean, it's wonderful to sort of hear these big names from history shaping history via the pages of the letters column of, of the Times. But is it always obvious who the letter is from? I mean, I now... You have to check the identity of everybody writing in, but has that always been the case? It hasn't always been the case, but there were a select few. The editor knew who these people were, and he gave permission for them to use an alias. The two famous ones I've got here are Benjamin Disraeli, who went by the name of Runnymede, and his fellow Tory, Sir Leo Amory, who went by the name of Tariff, or Tariff Reformer. Now, why they were granted anonymity or an alias... I think it's been lost in the mists of time. I did ask the archive editor and he couldn't tell me. And if he doesn't know, then well, perhaps someone out there knows, but I, I don't know. And you've had letters too from royals. On April the 6th, 1864, a letter from Queen Victoria was published in the Times. Now she hand wrote it and got one of her henchmen to take it to the paper and hand it in. But... Um, because it's not in the first person, it's in the sort of royal we, the third person, it's not immediately obvious it's from her. It was about the three years she spent in mourning in her widow's weeds. And the paper, I think, was saying, come on, get on with, you know, being head of state. And she took exception to this. And it ends this way. The Queen will, however, do what she can in the manner least trying to her health strength and spirits to meet the loyal wishes of her subjects, to afford that support and countenance to society, and to give that encouragement to trade which is desired of her. More the Queen cannot do, and more the kindness and good feeling of her people will surely not exact from her. <laughs> well, Andrew, you came over all Queen like well, that. Uh, I've never done Queen Victoria before, and hopefully I won't again. <laughs> And for you, when you're starting the day with hundreds of letters, not all from the monarch or the prime minister, how do you go about choosing what makes it into the column? People quite often ask me this, and, and there's no straightforward answer. I mean, you just know when you've got a good letter. And you're not looking for a single type of letter. I mean, the page has quirky bits. It has the bottom right funnies. It has deeply serious letters, has in-between letters. I'm also looking out for a really important letter from someone who knows what they're talking about, someone who's actually been in the situation they're writing about, who, mm. who can offer a fresh perspective on whatever news story is in the news. But I'm also looking for relatively brief on concise letters, succinct ah. letters, because the number one problem that every letters editor that's ever been on this paper has struggled with is the lack of brevity. People overwrite and overwrite and overwrite. And similarly, it doesn't necessarily help if you get 3,000 people to sign your letter. You know, the, the letter uh. either has power or it doesn't. 
That's interesting. Uh, Do big names increase your chance of publication? It depends what they're saying. I'm not going to name this cabinet minister, but a very well-known cabinet minister wrote to me last week, and I'm afraid the letter was so boring that that I couldn't publish it. So no. (laughs) And you also get a great sense of the stories that are really cutting through, the ones that are affecting people's lives, the ones that people want to write in about. One of the big stories of the year was a political story which had, you know, real-world effects, and that was the decision to send migrants to Rwanda. What sort of a response did you get to that? A lot of response is the answer to that. There was one particular letter which made the stories, I think, on our paper, on Times Radio, and on other publications. This was the one that was signed by every Lord Spiritual, everyone from Justin Welby, Archbishop of Canterbury, to the Most Reverend Stephen Cottrell, Archbishop of York, da-da-da-da-da, the full works. So, this one was written in June and obviously still hasn't happened. Whether or not the first deportation flight leaves today for Rwanda, this policy should shame us as a nation. Rwanda is a brave country recovering from catastrophic genocide. The shame is our own because our Christian heritage should inspire us to treat asylum seekers with compassion, fairness and justice, as we have for centuries. Those to be deported to Rwanda have had no consideration of their asylum claim, recognition of their medical or other needs, or any attempt to understand their predicament. Many are desperate people fleeing unspeakable horrors. To reduce dangerous journeys to the UK, we need safe routes. The Church will continue to advocate for them, but deportations and the potential forced return of asylum seekers to their home countries are not the way. This immoral policy shames Britain. And i say that was one of the uh, few times recently when a letter from the church actually did make waves and and politicians did sit up, although obviously hasn't um, changed the policy as yet. Does it just show how a letter to the Times can still change the public debate? It can still have a, a real effect on policy and on how people are talking about it? Yes, I mean, there's, there's, it's unquestionable that a powerful letter to the Times resonates across government, and I know the, the government read our page because they write the next day and complain mm. bitterly about it and, 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 and demand, you know, so-called rights of reply, And to which I have to remind them that, you know, this is still a free country, we have free expression, and whilst we do correct errors of fact, you know, we don't correct so-called errors of opinion. But what the wonderful thing, I think, about our our paper is the way that we will take an issue and campaign for it. One is the Times Time to Mind campaign about young people's mental health. And on that theme, if I may, there was a very good letter in from Dame Susan Hill, the author, novelist of The Woman in Black, after we did an investigation into student mental health. Sir, in my first undergraduate term at King's College London, I was overwhelmed by everything. London itself, unfamiliar surroundings, pressure of exciting but challenging new work. I missed friends and hadn't yet made new ones. I had panic attacks without knowing what these were, nightmares and agoraphobia. One day, the Dean of Arts, seeing me sitting in the quad looking miserable, asked how things were going. I burst into tears. He gave me his card and said, This is my address. Come to family Sunday lunch. My wife always expects extras. You need home cooking, a fire and a three-piece suite. Never has any doctor written a more effective prescription. Roast lamb, apple crumble, young children and their rabbits, a comfy sofa and no questions asked. It took only one more such Sunday for misery to be defeated. For those students who are mentally ill, even suicidal, which I was not, it takes more than a family roast and a sofa, but I have never forgotten how much the Dean's gesture meant to me 62 years ago. I say that's Dame that's, Susan Hill. Wonderful, that's wonderful writing from her. Yeah, how lovely. And how lovely to, to write in, acknowledging it may not be everybody's experience, but what a useful Well, also anecdote. a wonderfully personal yes. tale, uh, which I've never heard before. And I've you know, read various of her books, but didn't know that story. One of the other big moments this year, the moment of national history, was obviously the Queen's death. Did you receive a lot of letters? I did receive a lot of letters. I, I couldn't tell you. I just haven't had time to count them up. And there were some wonderful, wonderful letters here. Can I just give you a few? 
This is from Carol Hughes, the widow of Ted Hughes, and um, again, very affecting letter. Sir, when my late husband Ted Hughes, then Poet Laureate, was due to be invested with the insignia of the Order of Merit in October 1998, a prestigious honour in the personal gift of the Sovereign, his final illness and its treatment had already seriously affected his physical health and somewhat reduced his mental acuity. Nevertheless, he was determined to keep this royal appointment and we arrived at Buckingham Palace as instructed. Her Majesty was fully aware of Ted's illness and graciously invited me to join him for the audience. The conversation that ensued seemed, for the most part, a strange monologue from Ted, allowing little space for the Queen to participate or respond, but she listened intently and courteously throughout. Her sensitivity to his situation was very apparent, and for that I will be forever grateful. Ted died twelve days later. It's just a beautifully poignant letter. The other one, um, I don't want you to think it's only famous people that write. This is from Mike Hattersley of Milnthorpe in Cumbria, uh, and it's an absolutely wonderful letter. So, in 1954, the Queen visited Bradford. My mother took me, aged seven, and my brother, aged nine, to watch her arrival at the town hall. All we saw was the roof of her Rolls Royce, and we were in tears. So mother took us to see her departure from Manningham Station. Again, we couldn't get anywhere near. Tears again. My resourceful mother then led us along a street or two, darted down an alley, pushed us up on a wall, and told us to watch and wait. After the music and cheering at the station died down, half a mile to our right, the royal train drew towards us. Behind a glass carriage door stood our Queen and Prince Philip. They had thrown off their coats and stood together looking out, with their arms around each other. No doubt they were glad their official duties were over, but when they saw two little boys on the wall, they came alive, really waving, just for us. That wasn't duty, it was love. Beautiful letter. What a lovely letter. And it's it's wonderful because it brings out so many personal experiences of a big national moment, and it must feel quite special to be sharing those. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you can't run them all, but um, she did touch an enormous number of people's lives in a sort of quite a profound way, in a way that you perhaps reading newspapers and listening to the radio or watching TV, you don't fully appreciate. But when someone takes the time to write a heartfelt letter to you like that, you realise that she did matter. The letters page does have these very poignant letters, but it also sort of has lighter moments too. This one, I think it's an absolutely fabulous letter. It's in response to Melanie Phillips' column. She's one of our columnists. Seeing tattoos makes me feel physically sick and a wonderfully graphic headline. And it's a very unexpected letter in response. Sir, Melanie Phillips has quite an extraordinary and outdated view on tattoos and has clearly missed what they show. If you have two candidates for a job, one with tattoos... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, better read it again. I love this. If you have two candidates for a job, one with tattoos and one without, which do you employ? Obviously, the one with the tattoos. They are proving that they can make appointments, turn up on time and sit for hours while having needles stabbed into their skin. In other words, they are well prepared for the world of corporate meetings. <laughs> That's from somebody called Voiry Blunt uh, and Beverly East Riding, a wonderful town. Um, on a purely personal basis, this is a very much closer to home letter, if you wanted to end on. Charlie Wilson, the mercurial, fantastic editor of The Times, in his obituary, did spark this wonderful letter from David Sapstead, who worked under him, and says this, Sir Charlie Wilson was the finest editor I worked for in more than a half century in journalism. The only time he really got mad with me was when I was in the office in London, pulling together a story on a ferocious hurricane that had hit the Caribbean. To amuse the sub-editors, I sent across the story with the byline, by Joe Bloggs in Antigua and David Sapstead, who wishes he was. Yeah. Unfortunately, it wasn't spotted until it appeared on page one of the first edition. The next day, Charlie was furious and gave me what is best described as a colourful dressing down in the middle of the newsroom. When he had finished, I asked if he was so cross 
course I should have written, who wishes he were rather than he wishes he was. For a moment, Charlie stiffened in anger. Then he exploded in laughter, (laughs) called me an extremely rude name and walked off, shaking his head and telling me I was a hopeless case. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's a great journalism story that. that's wonderful I'd like to think that would still happen now somewhere in the newsroom <laughs> I, I think it probably is happening all over Britain as we speak yeah. <laughs> at least I hope so my name's Stephen Bleach and I'm the letters editor of the Sunday Times And I do a few different things on the paper. I write leading articles and I write features and things. But my main job is what my title suggests. I'm the letters editor. And that is by far the most fun of everything I do. And how different is it to editing letters on the daily? The difference in the letters page reflects the difference in the two sister titles. We are able to take a big picture view, a longer term view, perhaps sometimes a more relaxed view away from the daily cut and thrust and hurly-burly of politics. And it's an amazing read, the Daily Letters page. It's an essential read, and it has the great and the good getting stuck into that debate. We focus a lot more on the readership. When we do get people who are the great and the good, the MPs, the ministers, and uh, the corporate bigwigs writing to us, more often than not, they don't actually get in because they haven't said anything particularly interesting. Um, I think our theory is the Sunday Times is full of people in positions of power telling us what they think. The letters page is is where we want to hear what the readers think. And if those people in positions of power are genuine readers, that comes across, then absolutely. But they don't get there by dint of their job. Take us back to one of the the stories of the year, one of those moments that everybody in the public seemed to have an opinion over. Tell us about how the letter writers responded to Partygate. They were angry. The thing that surged through in the postbag was just the level of indignation amongst our readers. And I don't think it's being unfair to the government then or Boris Johnson to say that it was just overwhelming the Mm. amount of anger against the government at the beginning of the year. And as always, quite often, people make a lot of very intricate arguments, but very often the thing that is most telling is somebody's personal experience. And we had something in January, a letter from a Dr W.F. Cook of London SE10, which summed up for me the, the anger that people had about Partygate. And she started it with... I'm writing this through tears of sadness, rage and incredulity. And she goes on to detail how her mother was dying in a hospital in Durham at the exact time of the first garden party and how she was prevented from seeing her because she... uh, Well, I'll, I'll use her words. I was prevented from being with her because I never felt I had the right to ignore rules that were stipulated for the rest of the country. I witnessed her terrible death from afar and I was helpless to intervene. As this was happening, the PM and his staff saw fit to break the rules. They were free to spread the virus as they saw fit. Booze and fun and who cares about the consequences? The PM has no moral compass. He is shallow, shameless, narcissistic liar and he is not fit to lead the country. As that one shows, as they often do, it's somebody's personal experience. It's when they're speaking from something they themselves have been through. That's when you have something that comes across that's most powerful. Mm. Did you have letters also coming in supporting Boris Johnson? We absolutely did. And there were a number who felt that Boris Johnson was very unfairly traduced. And one of them, in fact, was from somebody the readers might know. I'm just going to put it here we are. This came through to us in April. Boris was still in office. And it comes from uh, a reader. He happens to be Mr. John Rhys Davis of the Isle of Man. Readers might know him. He's Gimli in The Lord of the Rings. He's a great British character actor. But also, it turned, it, I just realised this because like, uh, the name seemed familiar. So I, I looked him up. But he's also, it turns out, a very much a fan of Boris Johnson. And he says, uh, really? Boris has old Brexit, the greatest political crisis of my lifetime. 
and proved we're still a democracy. On COVID, every country got some things wrong, but his decision on backing vaccines was bold and effective and saved many lives. And he led Europe and NATO in his support of Ukraine, galvanising a new sense of resistance to tyranny. Any one of these would guarantee him a place in history. We are right to note his failings, but we should recognise that this man will go down as the most significant Prime Minister since Churchill. So there was some support for Boris Johnson, and we, uh, as always, tried to reflect that if the letters were good enough. Mm. Uh, a letters page is not an opinion poll, and we don't have to reflect the opinions of our readers precisely, I don't think. It's about how good they are. But naturally, one wants to give a mix of views. When you get people who are starting to write in, you're getting a, a sense of what's happening across the country. It's sort of giving you the news in its own way. Does it feed into more of the reporting on the paper? Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm physically close to a lot of the reporters in the newsroom and uh, we, we speak all the time. And absolutely, uh, what the readers say to us on the letters page, and even the letters that, that we're not able to publish because space is limited, it all informs our reporting. If you send a letter in to us and you have a fair point to make about any of our articles, the person who wrote those words will know it. And in terms of some of the incredibly intelligent and personal letters that you do receive, it's been so interesting to see the ones that the, the stories that get a response, they're not always the big front page lead. There was a really interesting set of letters around grief. Tell us a bit about that. Well, we'd run a story in the paper um, giving readers the news that grief was to be reclassified as a mental illness if it lasted more than a year after the death of the loved one. The idea being that long-term grief can be quite debilitating and could perhaps be treated, I suppose. But that prompted a letter from Elizabeth Slynn of Winchester, which I found tremendously moving. And I'll, I'll read it in full, even though it's not short, because I think it's worth it. Mm. The suggestion that to intensely yearn for a loved one a year after their death may be classified as a mental illness provoked a sharp intake of breath in me. I lost my adult daughter to suicide seven years ago. The first year is indeed raw and brutal in its onslaught of pain. Never a moment passed when she was not in my thoughts and dreams. The first anniversary did not bring some automatic cure and relief. It was two years before I stood on an empty beach and realised that, in that moment, I cannot vouch for those before and after, in that moment I felt happy. My daughter, excuse me, my daughter still enters my dreams. I can smell and feel her. But I've learnt to understand this as part of my healing journey. We who grieve should not be made to feel we must be pitied for still being preoccupied more than a year after the event. That is incredibly powerful. I'm going to read one more, which is much shorter. This is from Dr. Barbara Ray of Perthshire. Grief is the price of love. When you lose your soulmate, you don't get over it. I still grieve for my wonderful husband 30 years after his death. I will miss him until the day God reunites us. That is not pathology, that is love. That's rather beautiful. Isn't it? And just finally, Steve, in order to talk to us about the best of the letters over the year, you've gone over a lot of letters pages, a whole year's worth. Yeah. Looking back, what did it tell you about 2022 and what kind of a year it's been? I would love to come up with something as pithy and sparkly as our readers so often do. I think it tells me that it's been a year of disquiet and some anger, a year that has felt chaotic and a little bit like events are getting beyond our control. It's been an uncomfortable year, I think. But I take huge heart from the fact that the public out there are grounded and sensible and also have a sense of humour. We're not going to throw up our hands in horror and say the world's coming to an end on Tuesday. The fact is, we're going to dig in and get on with it and maybe crack a bit of a bad joke or even a good joke here or there. 
it's given me a sense of permanence and a sense of reassurance that while things are in a pretty terrible state, personally, I think I've been around quite a while and I can't remember seeing our public life in such a in such disarray for, for many decades, we'll be saved by the good sense of our public.